one place I would like to start is, is, you know, your medical training. Um, you know, what was it that made you pursue a career in medicine? And how did that? How did that lead to a, a, a Vietnam deployment in 1967? Well, as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be a physician. My dad was an oral surgeon, and I grew up in his office. And he always discouraged me from going into any field of dentistry and encouraged me to go into medicine. Um, my older brother, Bobby, who is now a retired physician and is uh, will be 87 this year, uh, had bad childhood asthma, and he's seven years older than I am. And when I was a youngster, I can recall Bobby being sick with asthma attacks, and we would call the family doctor, Dr. Lurton Airy, and he would arrive at the house in a brown suit with a white shirt and a brown fedora hat and at night, and he would come in and in those days, there was very little medicine for asthma. There were no steroids. There was only epinephrine and an IV drug called aminophilin. And he would hang an IV on Bobby, and he would sit there, and Bobby would be wheezing, and I would go to sleep. And the next morning, I would wake up, and Dr. Airy would still be there. And my mom would give him breakfast, and off he would go in his Buick to work. And I, we were so grateful to him. I, I think that's what uh, originally attracted me to medicine. So um, I went to college, I went to high school in Danville, Virginia, where I was raised after the war and uh, went to college at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, my dad's alma mater. <clears throat> and went to med school at the Medical College of Virginia, which is one of the oldest medical schools in the South. Now it's uh, called the Virginia Commonwealth University. It was established in 1838. And when I was in medical school, uh, Vietnam was heating up and there was a program uh, called the Army Senior Medical Student Program where one could joined the army in the as a junior in medical school and then get paid a uh, first lieutenant's pay while a senior for no obligation except that after graduation one had a three-year obligation instead of a normal two-year obligation in those days <clears throat> there was a draft doctor's draft and virtually every able-bodied male was being drafted uh, so I thought I was a struggling young medical student. I had a wife and a baby. My daughter was born Christmas Day, 1963, just a month after the Kennedy assassination. And um, I graduated medical school in 1966. So I, my dad had been an army officer all during World War II, and I remembered our life in the army, so I thought it was as natural as uh, night and day for me to go into the army. And I thought Vietnam was the right place to be at that time, and I could choose the year. So I uh, went up to Fort Meade, Maryland with another medical student um, in 1964, I believe it was 64, and we signed up. And then uh, during the senior year in med school, I got a first lieutenant's pay, which in those days was about $400 a month. And the bonus to that was that Richmond, where I was going to med school, was dry, couldn't buy a drink in a restaurant, but we could go to the officers club at Fort Lee, Virginia. And they had a bar, so that was a bonus. And um, so when I graduated, I was commissioned a captain immediately, and I could have interned in a civilian hospital, but I chose a military hospital. It's a complex matching situation. Doctors know what I'm talking about. But I was able to match with the hospital of my choice, which was Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu. 
And in fact, that was the hospital in which I was born. Different building, different place, but the same name of the hospital uh, where I was born in 1941. Were you able to take your family there or did you go on your own? No, no, I was, it was an accompanied tour and I took my wife and baby. We drove across the country and um, we flew from Travis Air Force Base to Honolulu. The car came on a boat. That's kind of interesting. I had a car that I bought when I graduated from med school on time. The car came on the boat and the boat would not be unloaded because there was a longshoreman strike in Honolulu. And Bobby Kennedy was the attorney general. And apparently he was very favorable to this longshoreman union. And the car sat on the boat for like five months before it was delivered. And we didn't have a car and we were stationed at uh, Schofield Barracks, which is 27 miles from the hospital. So the army ran a bus at 0600 going to the hospital and at 2200, 10 o'clock at night coming back. So it was a long day for interns uh, who lived at uh, Schofield. But that's how I got into the army. And your intention all along, it sounds like, was to go to Vietnam eventually. Yes, I was interested in aviation. I was a private pilot. And uh, I intended to be a flight surgeon. And in those days, uh, flight surgeons in Vietnam went together like dogs and fleas. So just for people who aren't uh, super knowledgeable about, about the field of medicine, about the, about the profession, uh, can you talk a little bit about what makes a flight surgeon different than a, uh, another kind of surgeon? Yes, we have aviation medical training in the medical problems that are particular to aviators and their crews. And they can be psychological or physical. Uh, fear of flying is a very real uh, problem. And some aviators in combat come down with this. And it's up to the flight surgeon to know his aviators, know the aviators in his squadron to talk to them, to drink with them, to play cards with them, to be very aware of all of their uh, domestic and other problems and know when to ground them, when to let them fly. Also to know about physical problems that are particular to aviation, particularly things um, that involve altitude and pressure volume, sinusitis, eye problems, things like that. And um, we have special training. I trained at Fort Rucker, Alabama in the Army Flight Surgery Program. And then part of that was at Pensacola, Florida in the Navy Flight Surgery Program. And then I deployed to Vietnam almost immediately. So this was, uh, sounds like, uh... August of 67, and you were on a charter flight, I believe, right? A commercial, a commercial airline. I'm 67, yes. I think we were, I think it was a United Airlines charter flight um, that went, we flew out, I flew out to uh, San Francisco and we were housed, I say we, the fellows that were going to Vietnam, we were housed at uh, the BOQ, Bachelor's Officers Quarters at Fort Mason which is a extinct post in San Francisco, <clears throat> Fort Mason. And then we were notified when the flight was leaving from Travis Air Force Base, which is just about an hour north of San Francisco. And we, we were at Fort Mason for two or three days waiting for this flight. Then we went up to uh, Travis, got on the United flight and flew to uh, Tonsonut, Saigon. And I think the flight took 22 hours. We stopped for food and fuel at Honolulu and I believe at Guam. And about every six hours, the civilian stewardesses came through the plane, which was jammed six abreast uh, and threw out uh, fried chicken boxes, you know, with a chicken meal, fried 
fried chicken and coleslaw and all that stuff you get from Colonel Sanders. Hmm. I think Fort Mason is a park now. I believe I've spent some time in that park. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, I mean, what sort of frame of mind were you in for 22 hours on a flight to Vietnam? You know, can uh, you, what were you imagining or expecting or hoping for? Well, 22 hours is a long time. Uh, I sat next to the same person for 22 hours. And uh, we had gotten on the plane together. We had kind of palled around together. He was another doctor <clears throat> at Fort Mason, the few days we had in San Francisco. And so we spoke about what to expect. Both of us were similar in that we were young married men with a single baby child. My child uh, was three and a half. And I think his was two. We talked about our families. We talked about what our assignments might be, what it might be like. We were excited to go. I mean, it was an adventure, right? We were young men. Uh, I was 26 years old and um, roaring to get there and do my duty and then come home and complete my training. I talked to, um... I've talked to a couple of veterans who were, who were enlisted men, who were infantry, army infantry. Um, one of the things that they talk about is how well prepared they thought they were. They really thought that the training they got for jungle warfare in particular was very, very good and that they, were, that they felt very prepared for what they faced when they got there. I, I wonder with so, much, with so much ground to cover in, in just be becoming a flight surgeon, was there time to prepare you for the conditions that you would see when you got there? Uh, I think I was well prepared um, for most aspects. Uh, being a squadron flight surgeon out in the field requires you to know about hygiene and sanitation and the way to take care of food and latrine facilities and things like that. And I think I was prepared for that. Uh, being a flight surgeon, <clears throat> we, we actually memorized a multi-page Army Regulation, AR 40-501, Army Regulation 40-501, that is all about aviation, what the physical and mental requirements are for that. And we literally had to commit that to memory and know that upside down and backwards. And I think I was prepared. I was young and probably immature, but so was everybody else that I was dealing with in my squadron, except my squadron commander and my XO uh, who were in their forties. Uh, but yes, I think I was prepared. I, I didn't feel unprepared. I, I didn't lack confidence when I went. Great. So you land in at Tonsonut in August of 67. Um, can you actually, tell us about actually, I have to correct that. I said Tonsonut. We actually landed at Benoit Air Base, which is right next to Tonson, very close. Got to it. Right. I think I spoke to a guy who was uh, um, an MP. Um, he was a dog handler at Benoit mm -hmm. uh, at around the same time there's a good chance that he he was there when you landed can you talk about the first you know three or four months there um what do you remember from that period what what well what, what we landed and then well i can talk about the landing which was interesting and something i was totally unprepared for we landed at benoit in the middle of the night it was dark and uh, uh these mps got on with submachine guns slung over their shoulders and the doors were opened and it was just hot, fetid and hot and just uh, humid. It was, when I got on the airplane, you know, I had starch khakis on, I, the creases in my pants could have cut bread. And when I got off the airplane, I looked like I'd been through a washing machine. It was, I'd been in there for 22 hours. And the first thing I noticed when I got off in the dark and was the smell, which was, raw sewage um it was a third world country and um it, it was 
totally different. Of course, we got used to that and the heat. And then the MPs loaded us on buses and told us to stay down if we heard gunfire to hit the floor of the bus. So that was like, wow, I wasn't, no one told me about that. So they took us to a barracks at Benoit. And this was similar to the Repel Depot, the replacement depot of World War II. And we waited there for three or four days in process. And then we received our assignments. And they took us on a C-130, took me and uh, all the people that could fit on a C-130 that was combat loaded up to on K, which was the rear area of the 1st Cavalry Division. And we met the, the division surgeon of the 1st Cavalry Division, who I had known, I don't, I can't remember how I knew this guy, but I knew him from my days in San Antonio before. And he said he had two positions. One is D division flight surgeon, which was in the rear, and one as surgeon for the 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry, which was involved in daily combat and whose last flight surgeon had been killed in action. So this other fellow that I rode the plane with and that I palled around with in San Francisco, I told him, I said, I'll flip you for it. And the winner gets to choose where he wants to go. He says, no, I do not want to go with the first of the ninth. I'm married with a young child. I said, so am I. I'm married with a young child. He said, I know I do not want to flip. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So uh, this division flight surgeon gave me the thumbs up sign and a big, big smile. And they choppered me out to LZ two bits, which was in the Bong Song Valley of Vietnam, just at the north side of Tu Cor, if you're familiar with the geography, right below Da Nang, south of Da Nang. And we had two landing zones, LZs up there, Two Bits and Dog were their names. And these are just uh, landing zones just carved out of the jungle, just mud and a bunch of hooches and landing areas. And um, sandbag places and holes in the ground and uh, it was in the field. So I had a, a battalion or squad, we called our battalion size unit a squadron because it was aviation. I had a squadron size Quonset hut at On K in the rear for an aid station. And it was named the Chenep Memorial Dispensary because the man I replaced was Carl Chenep, a young doctor from Memphis, Tennessee, who had been killed in action in April of 1967. Now this is August of 1967. And then in the forward area, I had two sandbag tents, which were aid stations. And our mission was to protect the health of the people in my squadron and also um, to take care of wounded, to do life and limb saving procedures on wounded when they were wounded in the field and brought back to the aid station until they could be stabilized and evacuated to a, uh, a better equipped facility like a surgical hospital or a field hospital or an evacuation hospital. <clears throat> and uh, we had a civic action duty also. There was a little town village called Bong Song. And once a week I went, took my Jeep with a medic and went down to Bong Song and held sick call for the civilians. For the, and that was really busy. I mean, the, everybody would come with everything. I saw leprosy, I saw things I had never seen before. Um, and we would take care of them. But, but the main job was taking care of the aviators and the crew. And I had uh, 17 combat medics who were in my medical platoon who went out on operations with the infantry. And we call them the blues, infantry. Blue is the color of the infantry. So they would ride helicopters out. <clears throat> helicopters were like horses of the old. It was the cavalry. We were the eyes and ears of the division. 
they would ride the helicopters out. They would do operations out there. They would pick up wounded. They would pick up dead. The helicopters would come back with those gray green body bags with people in them. Uh, also, it'd bring back Vietnamese, Viet Cong, and NVA POWs who they had captured if they were wounded. We would treat them too and evacuating, evacuate them if required. So, and then there was a sanitation and hygiene question, which I touched on. So I felt, I didn't feel unprepared, but I felt like uh, I was always really busy. I mean, I didn't have any downtime and I felt pressure. That's what I wrote home. I, I recently reviewed some of the audio tapes that I made to my parents and my wife <clears throat> and I talked about the pressure, the enormous job I had and the little time to do it. I had these medics and I had uh, two sergeants. I had a sergeant first class and a staff sergeant who were like the boss of the medics and who controlled things. <clears throat> and I was supposed to have a second lieutenant administrative officer, but I never got one of those. So I was really busy. And I flew on operations. I flew enough to get three air medals. And uh, each air medal is 50 hours of combat support or 20 out, 25 hours of direct combat. And you did all that between uh, August and December? On 30 November, yes. 30 yeah. November. <clears throat> oh right, right. Because you okay, yeah. You the, the the crash would have been in November. Thirty November, yeah. Winston Churchill's birthday. <laughs> Winston Churchill's birthday. So, um, you know, forgive me. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, you know, a military historian. Help me understand. Um, you know w what you were doing on that helicopter that day, and how does a helicopter crash into the side of a mountain? Yeah, that's a good question with an easy answer. I had troops, my unit, my squadron, a battalion sized unit with approximately 900 people uh, was spread out in Vietnam from Phan Thiet in the south to Chu Lai in the kind of the northern border of the middle of the country, about 300 miles. So I visited troops all over them the place. And uh, that particular night, the night of 30 November, we flew up to Chulai uh, to give a lecture, ironically enough, on the dangers of night flying to a group of my unit that was up at Chulai. And the weather was horrible. It was uh, pouring rain and wind and lightning and thunderstorms. And in those days, most of the helicopter pilots didn't even have what's called IFR. You know what that is? Instrument flight rules. They, they, were, they flew by sight, VFR, visual flight rules. Today, it, 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 commercial pilots and most advanced pilots have what's called an IFR ticket. Uh, an ability to fly with instruments. They have a special license for that. So <clears throat> visibility is not so important. <clears throat> and um, so I went up there to lecture to the, this small group about the dangers of night flying. And I said to the aircraft commander, who was a very good friend of mine, Steve Porcella, he's from Massachusetts, he was a major. And I said, Steve, let's wait out the weather because it's so bad. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, our mission is not so important, but we have to get the helicopter back by, for operations tomorrow. So we took off just terrible weather and it, it was dark. And we were, uh, I was watching the trucks on a highway beneath me it's called Highway One. Much of it was a dirt road, not even paved. Uh, it went north south, not even paved. <clears throat> and I saw that we had drifted west of the highway, and I knew that was wrong. And I called Steve on the radio when the helicopter was about nine o'clock at night. I called him on the radio and I said, I think we've drifted west of the highway. 
and he called um, an air traffic controller at Duc Phu, Vietnam, which was close. And the, he asked him to identify his position. There's a thing on a helicopter called a transponder and you can send a signal that the air traffic controller can see and identify the, the location of the helicopter. <clears throat> so the air traffic controller at Duck Fo said to him, I cut off my equipment at 2100, nine o'clock. It take a minute or so to warm up. Do you want me to cut it on and find you? And Steve said, Raj. And that was the last thing he ever said. The next thing I knew, the helicopter was on fire. I was waking up, coming, uh, coming to, and I could see that we were crashed. And I didn't know what happened, whether we crashed in the mountain or we got shot down or I, I had no idea. I just, and I remember vividly, and it was 53 years ago, 54 years ago now, and I remember vividly waking up, and the first thing I said was, is anybody alive? And I really didn't know for like a millisecond if I were alive. I, I just, it was the strangest, strangest sensation. And by the light of the fire, firelight, I could see Steve crushed against the, the instrument console. And the co-pilot, a very fine young warrant officer from a very affluent family in New Haven, Connecticut, was not there. His seat had failed and he had gone right through the glass chin bubble of the helicopter, still strapped in his seat, which I didn't see at the time. I had trouble freeing myself because I had a broken left arm and uh, my head had hit something and my, I was bleeding profusely from the face and I ran my tongue over my teeth and I was immediately aware that I'd lost a bunch of teeth. Turned out to be seven. And uh, Steve had a knife on his right side and he was crushed against the, the instrument panel and I tried to, I took his knife out of the sheath and tried to cut his seat belt and it's not like in the movies. I mean, it didn't just cut easy. And, and the fire just got too hot. I'm sure he was dead anyway. I'm sure he was dead. The fire got too hot. And I jumped from the, the helicopter. And when I jumped from the helicopter, I saw Mr. B Mr. the co-pilot on the, on the ground, still in his seat. And I saw the crew chief even beyond him, a guy named Sergeant McKee who I didn't know at all. I'd only met him on that trip and he was just on the ground. And um, the airplane just whooshed, whooshed up. Just, it didn't explode, it just was whoosh and everything burned up. And um, so that was how we crashed. The answer to your question, what are you doing on a helicopter and why did it crash? I later found out, the Viet Cong told me when they captured me that they shot down the helicopter. But I later found out that it was found right at the top of the mountain where it had hit and it was a crash. And in fact, the flight surgeons who investigated the accident, and that's another task of flight surgeons is to investigate accidents, <clears throat> ruled it a non-survivable accident. You know, there are so many Gs that the aircraft can take and that had taken beyond the survivability, but I survived. And you weren't, you weren't far, I guess, based on your telling, you weren't far from the highway, from Highway 1. Um, I, we thought, uh, the, war, the warrant officer co-pilot and I thought that we were about 10 miles west of friendly troops. That's what we thought. Um, so the first, at first light, the next morning, it was pouring rain too. I mean, absolute pouring rain. And the next morning, and we just sat there, the copal was very seriously injured, had an open fracture of his ankle and, and the bones were just sticking through the nylon of his jungle boot. Uh, the next, next day we sent the, uh, crew chief for help. We thought we knew where we were and the crew chief was not injured. 
not terribly. And he'd be, he had a concussion, was knocked out, and had bruises, but he wasn't seriously injured. He never came back and uh, found out much later, six years later, he had been found shot dead and submerged in a rice paddy about 10 miles from the crash site. <clears throat> so that leaves you and the co-pilot yeah. alone. And the co-pilot, we, we waited, uh, we crashed on the night of November 30, we're up all night, no food or water, December 1st, and uh, the co-pilot died on the morning of December 2nd. And he was, he was in a great deal of pain. We had no first aid kit. We had no nothing. We had nothing. Everything had burned up in the airplane. Everything. Had one, we actually had two 38 pistols and we'd given one to the crew chief. We had one 38 pistol with four rounds of ammunition. Yeah. And uh, we could hear helicopters flying over and I'd shot off a couple of those rounds trying to attract them. But the weather was so bad, we couldn't see them. They were over the cloud cover. And when he died, um, I left the crash site. So, um, the, so you had multiple injuries yourself. Yes, I had uh, a fractured left forearm or two bones in the forearm, radius and ulna, and a fractured collarbone left side. And I had some burns. Uh, and I had, uh, had lost those teeth and had lacerations on my face and lip. And um, when the helicopter blew, burned up, the M60 machine gun cooked off rounds. It's called cooked off. They explode, but it's not the same as firing. They don't have the same velocity, but they just explode and they send the, uh, the, bre the shell any which way and I got hit three or four times on the left side of my back and the front on the left side of my front with that exploding ammunition. And how long has it been since you've had food or water? Uh, when I I don't remember when we ate on November the 30th. I don't, I don't really remember but, uh, but this is December 2nd now. Yeah this is December 2nd and we had water, we had rain water, it was raining. And uh, I had splinted uh, the co-pilot's leg with two army belts and tree branches. I actually used uh, Steve Porcello's knife to cut the tree branches. <clears throat> and that's important to my story because when they discovered the helicopter the day after I was captured on December 3rd, uh, they said, that the co-pilot had been, quote, professionally splinted, which was kind of funny because he was splinted with cut tree branches and two army belts. And therefore they assumed that I was alive and not critically injured, which was true. And um, um, so I was, I was captured the day before, December 2nd. And I walked down the mountain and had fallen and walking down the mountain. I had my arm strapped to my body uh, with an army belt. And um, when I got down to the bottom of the mountain, I walked, uh, I don't know, a mile or so. And I saw a peasant working in a rice paddy. And he saw me and I had a fatigue jacket on that had captain's bars, insignia, and the medical insignia of the caduceus. And he ran up to me and he said, Dai Wee Boxi, which I knew very little Vietnamese, but that meant captain doctor, Dai Wee Boxi. And he took me another mile to a little hooch and uh, he went inside and gave me a can of sweetened condensed milk, a sea ration can opener and a plastic sea ration spoon. And I was sitting uh, eating that and a squad of VC came up and captured me. And I had my left arm bound to my body. So the squad leader said, surrender, no kill. And he spoke, he put both of his arms up in the air, said that in English, surrender, no kill. 
and I raised my right arm. My left arm was tied to my body, and I was absolutely exhausted. And I, I didn't, I don't know what I felt then. And he shot me. I think he was more scared than I was, and he shot me right through the left shoulder, uh, right where the, my neck joins my shoulder, and the bullet went all the way through just went through he and uh, then they pulled off my dog tags and took a medallion from around my neck which was very important to me that my dad had given me before I left which had a St. Christopher's medal on one side and the Star of David on the other and uh, it took my wallet and I had a cigarette lighter that had been given to me by my wife. They took the cigarette, Zippo cigarette lighter that was engraved, took that. And I showed them my Geneva Convention card, which is white with a red cross, which means I was a doctor, medical personnel. They're supposed to be treated differently than a prisoner of war, according to the Geneva Conventions. And the guy as, a non, up, as a non as a non combatant. Right. The guy tore up the card. And he said, no POW, no POW, criminal, criminal. That's what it, the, he said that in English. So what would, have been the, what would have been the reaction you would have expected upon presenting that card? Well, we were told in their escape and evasion course in, uh, in flight surgery school <laughs> that if, if we were captured, not to worry because we, were, we weren't supposed to be uh, treated as POWs were supposed to be treated as uh, retained personnel. And I knew uh, in World War II and in Korea, doc American doctors were allowed to run hospitals, no matter how rudimentary or makeshift, for POWs when they were captured. Um, and in fact, I didn't know this, but I found out later, it was interesting to me, that um, American doctors captured in the Battle of the Bulge, some of them actually worked in German hospitals. And um, they were asked if they wanted to, and they did. And um, that's interesting because I was captured in December and in July of 1968, seven months later, we were Indoctr an attempt was made to indoctrinate us in the jungle in Vietnam, and we got this big commissar, Mr. Ho. He came down and they gave us these courses, and it was an attempt at indoctrination. And he took me aside and he said, would you like to work at a Vietnam, Viet Cong hospital or Vietnamese hospital? They're underground. He said, you would be safer and we will give you a higher ration. And I I said, no. So I'll take my chances with my own people. I would never even think about doing that. And he told me, he said, well, you're making a mistake. He said, American doctors did work in German hospitals in World War II. This guy spoke English about like I'm speaking English to you now. Uh, so, uh, but I'm glad I stayed with my own people and took my chances. Are you, I mean, you're the only MD I'm aware of who That's was who true. was taking taken prisoner. That's true. <clears throat> um, did you have an opportunity? Uh, I mean, I almost I almost hate to use the word opportunity. Were there times during uh, your capture when you were able to help other POWs because uh, of your medical? I think I helped other POWs and the other POWs think I helped them, which is even more important and more objective. Um, I had no medicine. So you, I'm sorry. Sorry, forgive me. So you were allowed to, to treat them? as, no, as, as, as only in, when they were very close to dying. The camp medic would come down with a little uh, tray of medicines and say, here you are. And uh, the medicines were very meager, but I was able to advise uh, POWs about hygiene and sanitation. I was able to rarely, we would get medicine. 
I was able to teach the other POWs when to complain, how to complain about malaria or dysentery and try to get medicine. And then I would hoard the medicine and give it out when they actually got diseases because we couldn't depend on the Vietnamese to give us medicine. And this fellow, Mr. Ho, when he was there, we were all very, very sick with dysentery. I thought we were all gonna die. And I went to him and pleaded with him to get us chloromycetin, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic that's no longer used much, um, and some other medicine. And he did actually get that for us. I had to make a deal with him. Um, but we got that medicine and I think it saved several, a lot of our lives. Um, I did, we had once in a while, we would have access to a razor blade or something like that. And I was able to lance boils and um, minor stuff like that. Interesting, one of the experiences I had was one of the guards once had a bad infected ingrown toenail and he brought down a little tray with novocaine in it and some instruments and i removed his ingrown toenail he would happen to be an american who had crossed over which is another story in itself which i wow. don't yeah, discuss that's... today but okay okay well i if we have time at the end of the call i'd love to come back to um ask a few follow-up questions about your time as a as a prisoner but for now can we jump forward to march of 1973 and help me understand the circumstances of of your release how did that happen the war ended the war ended on january 27 1973 i think and most of the people who were captured at the time think it was because President Nixon uh, implemented the Christmas bombing of Hanoi and mined the Haiphong. The Vietnamese and Americans were in this uh, negotiation that was on and off. And um, then Nixon bombed, there was just widespread bombing of Hanoi. And um, in December, from December, I may have the dates a little wrong, December 18 to December 30 or 29. And after that, the peace was signed quickly, January 27. Because I think the Vietnamese felt like if, if they didn't sign it, they would, a lot of horrible things were happened that Nixon had completely lost patience. And the Congress was, the American people were totally against the war. The Congress was against the war. And um, so the peace ended, the peace was signed on January 27. We were sent home in groups. Uh, my group came home on 16 March, 1973. Uh, <clears throat> they gave us little uniforms to come home in. We'd been wearing these pajamas that were striped. <clears throat> and they gave us a little a pair of pants and a short sleeve shirt and a windbreaker and a little AWOL bag, which is like a little gym bag. And we could put stuff in that. We could keep our sandals and we could keep our prison uniforms if we wanted to. And they actually gave us a toothbrush and toothpaste and a pack of Vietnamese cigarettes. It's kind of funny because they never gave us anything while we were captured. <clears throat> and time came for release. And what was really interesting to me, we had a senior ranking officer, and I'd love for the listeners to hear this. His name was Ted Guy. He's, he's passed away now. Colonel Guy was Air Force. And we didn't get to see him much. And he tried to lead us clandestinely by codes through the walls and talking through the walls. And every time he got caught doing this, he was tortured terribly and had to go on the camp radio and apologize and you could tell he was being tortured and beaten and telling us to cease and desist and doing the stuff we were doing. So we'd all been captured five years or more. And Colonel Guy, and I had not even seen him till the war was over. 
he lines us up in the airport, Jai Lam Airport, it's about 40 guys. And he says to us, and get this, this is after five years of capture. He said, I want every man to hold his AWOL bag in his left hand. I want every man to unzip his windbreaker one third of the way down. I want you to walk out there like soldiers with dignity and pride and honor. It was very meaningful to me. Um, so it didn't work because they called us individually. We didn't go together, but he didn't know that. So they call my name individually and I go out and the first thing I see is this gigantic C-141 USAF on the fuselage and the American flag on the tail. And I almost fainted. I, I was absolutely overwhelmed. And uh, there was a brigadier general in class A uniform and he welcomed me home and he said, welcome home, Major Kushner. And I'd been promoted, which I didn't even know. And we shook hands and he hugged me and there were tears coming down his, his, his face. And he said, we're glad to see you, doctor. And then uh, they had an escort for me who was in the dental corps. And this fellow came forward and got me and uh, flight nurses were on this airplane. We got on the plane, we flew to the Philippines and we were in the Philippines for three or four days and they gave me temporary crowns on my teeth which were still all broken and fit me with glasses and uh, fitted us with uniforms and briefed us about what had happened while we were gone, let us call our families, took us to the PX at Clark Field and let us buy gifts for our families. And then we came home and we um, stopped in Hawaii for a day. And then we flew to my home of record, which was the hospital closest to my home of record, which was Valley Forge General Hospital in Pennsylvania. They flew, flew me to Andrews Air Force Base and then airlifted me by helicopter there where I met my wife, my then wife, and we are subsequently divorced and she passed away last year, 2019. And my um, mom and dad and my brothers came later, the day later or two days later. And I was in the hospital off and on for four months. I had four surgeries and was treated for malnutrition and malaria and dysentery. And I had a lot of stuff wrong with me. Then I went back to duty. Um, I came home in March. I went back to duty in August. And um, one of the things I'm most proud about, I am not proud of being captured. You know, we're not heroes being, anybody can get captured. I'm proud of the way I behaved while I was captured. And I'm very proud that I came back. I put it behind me. Um, I'm not a professional XPOW. I don't ride in parades. I just, I got retrained. The army was very good to me. They retrained me in the field that I wanted to be trained in. And I did that. And then I, my wife at the time really wanted to get out of the army and put down roots as she said. So we came to Florida where we had always intended to come. And I've had a very productive, fulfilling and successful medical practice. I've gone on missions all over the world, been to India three times, Africa once, South America, Central America, uh, Honduras. I've been to uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti. I've been to Turkey. And, uh, medical I, missions, specifically. Yeah, doing cataract surgery, mostly cataract. Uh, some other stuff cross-eyed children, oculoplastics, things like that. Uh, but uh, so I, um, I have no PTSD. I don't, I don't claim that. I uh, got some scars, uh, bullet wounds and stuff like that. But I think I've had a pretty normal life and uh, I do not let this experience defined me. It's not what I'm about. It was a bump in the road of my life. We talked a little bit about um, your headspace on the charter flight 
to Vietnam, is it even possible, is it even reasonable to ask you to contrast that with your headspace on the flight home from Vietnam? <laughs> no, we were euphoric. Uh, when I was uh, released, and for about a year after I came home, I could not sleep. I was absolutely like hyper. And I was used the time. I mean, I couldn't sleep, and I read and read and read and retrained and uh, and coming home, we were just jubilant. We were really, all of us were just jubilant. We were singing and talking and uh, we were extremely happy. And just, uh, I can't think of anything to compare it with, uh, but it was just a really happy flight. That's great. Well, you know, we talked, uh, I want to go back to, to, to your release for just a second because you know, obviously the, the war ended in January, but I'm wondering from your perspective, I mean, you couldn't have known that, could you? I mean, we, did you guys have news from the outside world? Oh, we knew when the war ended. First of all, we heard the guards, you know, I'd been captured five and a half years. I understood a little Vietnamese, quite a bit, actually. So we heard the guards talking amongst themselves and they played portable radios. They had them outside. Uh, our cells playing portable radios and they announced it the day or the next day we nice. knew something was happening yeah hmm. then they opened the camp up you know up until then well until the christmas bombing we were confined to our cells the cells had six men in it and we could not speak to anybody else and if they caught us they really tortured us punished us beat us hung us up and so we couldn't speak to anyone. We had a tap code on the walls. But after the Christmas bombing, they moved us from the prison we were in to the Hanoi Hilton. They opened it up. They put a volleyball court up, I mean, a basketball goal up. They put a ping pong table up. They increased our uh, rations. They fattened us up. I gained uh, like 20 pounds between the Christmas bombing and the time I came home. It was a completely different change in attitude. And they opened the, the place up so that we could talk to each other. They gave us checker sets and chess sets and decks of cards. It was a totally different experience. Yeah, so you knew you knew something had changed. Yeah. So, I, w I mean, I could talk to you all day. Um, there's one other question I'm, I, would, I would like to ask if, you're, if you have a few minutes. Yes. And so one of the things that really struck me in my research and preparing for this conversation, I mean, probably the thing that struck me the most is, is, you know, your accounts of the time in the jungle. Um, and, and having marched 560 miles over 57 days mm -hmm. through the jungle. Jungle in, and mountains. Yeah. And, and in, in, you know, in, presumably a very weakened condition. I guess one of the things that never I haven't found an answer to is, is why, why on earth would they march you guys through jungles and mountains, uh, five, five, 560 miles. What, for what purpose? To get us to Hanoi because we were all going to die and they wanted to use us as bargaining chips in the peace negotiations. It's as simple as that. In Hanoi, we got much better treatment. I mean, we got food, two meals a day. The food was terrible. It was a thin soup, a piece of bread, and two cups of water a day. But it was better than in the jungle. And also in the jungle, there was uh, we we were in a B fifty two raid. Uh, artillery was coming in frequently. And they almost, they, dis, they flew helicopters right through our camp. I think they knew our location. The Americans knew our location. And the Vietnamese thought that we were going to be rescued. I thought, I thought that was, all of this happened in February of 71. Late January and early February of 71. They moved us to a temporary camp for a few days. And then they made the decision to move us to Hanoi. We were 12 survivors of 27 people. And they broke us into two groups. And I was in the fast six group 
and uh, we took 57 days. The slow group took 180 days. We got up there in uh, April, left in February, got up there in April. Slow group got up there in August. Wow. So, yeah, just the, the whole thing is just so unimaginable to me. And this the idea that they, they marched you 560 miles because they wanted to keep you alive, but half of you died on the... Half of us had died. Oh, already? Half, half of you had died already. Yes. Ah, okay. Nobody died on the trek up there. Got it. Now it makes more sense. Actually, now it makes more actually, sense to me. They actually fed us better on the trek up there. We carried our own rice, and it, of course, the weight got less and less because we ate it as we went. And once we got to the Ho Chi Minh Trail, it wasn't very difficult uh, because, first of all, we were eating better and getting stronger. Second of all, because it was we were training. I mean, as we walked, you know, it was really hard the first couple of three weeks. But after that, it got easier. And then on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they had way stations every 12 or 15 miles. And we would make that in a day. And then you would stop and cook and rest. And they had hammocks. And it was much easier. It was much easier. And it, it, was, it got easier and easier as we went along. I see. That makes much more sense to me. The way I had read it or, or interpreted it was that half of you died on the march. No, which, no, yeah. not at all. Okay. Glad I was able to clarify that. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, you know, 57 days through jungles and over mountains and, um, you know, in those kinds of conditions. Is there an observation you made, a revelation, uh, uh, an insight that occurred to you during that march that that still resonates in you, da you daily? I mean, was there is there a moment from that march that that sticks with you? I learned a lot on the march, uh, but the, I don't think of anything daily about those times. Um, I really don't. I tend to look forward. If somebody brings it up, then I have no trouble talking about it, as we've illustrated uh, just now. But on the march, I learned a lot. I uh, saw that um, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail particularly, we saw whole units, uh, battalion-sized units, company-sized units, marching to Vietnam, marching to South Vietnam. We saw people rolling bicycles, carrying supplies, marching to South Vietnam. I saw a guy carrying two mortar rounds, which are quite heavy, on his back to South Vietnam. He had to go as far as we did, and he was carrying two mortar rounds. And I wondered at the time when I passed that guy, I said, what if one of those rounds is a dud? You know, he spent three months carrying <laughs> this ordinance down there, and if they fire one and it's a dud, I th thought that to myself. So I wasn't completely without, <laughs> without some humor. Um, but one of the things that occurred to me, and we saw where the B-52s would just destroy a road or a, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they would have a thousand Vietnamese, they were like little ants, they would come out and repair it in an evening, in an evening. And I saw the determination and the sacrifice that they were making, and I thought to myself, we're going to have to kill every one of these people, and are we willing to do that? Um, but in retrospect, I don't think we would have had to kill every one of those people. We would have just had to put troops into North Vietnam, which we were always reluctant to do. Um, but uh, so, and I also, I saw a whole uh, battalion, a company sized unit of female uh, North Vietnamese in uniform marching, armed with rifles and sidearms, marching down south. And um, we went to Vin. The 57 days took us to Vin, which is a railroad terminus south of Hanoi. And we all got on a train in Vin, V I N H. <clears throat> it's in North Vietnam, of course. And there was an operation going on simultaneously in South Vietnam called Lam Song. L-A-M-S-O-N 719. 
which was a South Vietnamese operation, and it was a disaster. And hundreds of uh, Arvin, do you know that term, Arvin, Army of the Republic of Vietnam? Hundreds of them were captured, and they were being put on the train with us to ride the last 180 miles to Hanoi train went at 10 miles an hour so it took and we were in box cars and i was thinking you know this is just like auschwitz they're just putting us in this box car <clears throat> and i was a little worried for my safety because i was put in this car with all these south vietnamese arvin guys there was no guard that i remember and many i saw them you don't know the term chu hoi you ever heard that term they chew hoi, the North Vietnamese were giving them things like cigarettes and they would chew hoi for a pack of cigarettes. Chew hoi meant turn their coat and fight on the other side. And there were several, not a lot, but several who were just after being captured would take a couple of packs of cigarettes and turn their coat. And that was a real revelation for me because we had been steadfast, we Americans had been steadfast. And we had been in a camp adjacent to Arvin's and they were steadfast. The ones that we had been captured with were extremely steadfast and they helped us a lot. They really helped us a lot. Of course, this is in the 68, 69, 70 and this Lom Song 719er happened in um, late 71 in April 71, early 71. <clears throat> so it was a different time, but all of those things made impressions on me. 